if you want like a regular beauty supply store, just the product alone is going to be to start up about $175,000. Just product. That's yep. not the lease. That's not the build out. That's just like getting enough product to just start you out. This is Grind Set, where we go inside the minds of those that grind. Celebrating and spotlighting entrepreneurship in Memphis with your host, Dana James Mwange and Williams Brack. Welcome to Grind Set, powered by Kazukian and presented by Epicenter. I'm Dana James Mwange, brand strategist and founder of Cheers Creative. And I'm Williams Brack, owner of Building Bankable Businesses. Let's start with a statistic. It's estimated that the black hair care and cosmetics industry is estimated to be worth $36.5 billion as of 2024. However, it's also estimated that less than 5% of the beauty supply stores in the United States are black owned. Well, today on Grindset, we are honored to host a true trailblazer and who's in Memphis, by the way, who defies this statistic. Her name is Chastity Monroe, owner of Pink Noir Beauty Supply and Cosmetics located right here in Memphis, Tennessee. It is the only black owned supply and cosmetic store in Memphis. Drawn upon her background in consumer research and marketing, she has not only carved out a niche in this competitive industry, and it is competitive and we are gonna get into it. <laughs> Through Pink Noir, Chastity is not just selling products, she's cultivating a community, celebrating diversity, and re- redefining beauty standards. Welcome to Grind Set Chassis. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here. Yeah, absolutely. And out of that 36.5 billion, that's produced by over 85,416 stores, of which Pink Noir is one. And the beauty industry employs over 222,000 people. That's a lot for the American economy. But I met Chastity for the first time in December celebrating her successes. And as a banker, it really, really warmed my heart to see that she has accessed the financial system. And as a matter of fact, her banker got up and gave a little speech, right? Because it takes a a village from her husband to her banker, to her accountant, and especially the customers. So really excited to talk about Pink Noir, its history coming from uh, Procter & Gamble um, and making that journey into entrepreneurship. You're listening to Grind Set, powered by Kazukian. And we'll be right back after the break with Chastity Monroe, owner of the Pink Noir Beauty Supply and Cosmetics. Grind set. Looking to make your event unforgettable? Let Kazookian handle all of your event production needs. At Kazookian, we specialize in event production services that elevate every moment. From flawless sound to captivating visuals, we've got you covered. Make your events shine with Kazookian. Contact us today at kazookian.com or give us a call at 901-512-6767. Kazookian! Welcome back to Grindset, powered by Kazookian and presented by Epicenter. We are back with our special guest, Chastity Monroe. So let's start at the very beginning. Let's take us all the way back. What was that moment that sparked the desire for you to start a beauty supply and cosmetic store? Yeah, so I think the seed kind of started way back when uh, when I was working for Procter and Gamble, and so that was actually my first, very first job out of college. It was my dream job, <laughs> what well, what I thought was my dream job, um, and I was doing consumer insights and market research, and so I worked on various categories, but I ended up in beauty, working on Clairol. And so we would do a lot of um, what we would call uh, 
demographic research, right? Um, and so we would really talk to black women about some of the Clairol products. And, you know, you're talking about the market. And one of the things that consistently came up was this disdain for the beauty supply channel as a whole. And so as we were educating them on, you know, the brands and the the actual product, they were like, you know, it would be great if somebody was in the beauty supply to tell us some of these types of things. But instead, they're hounding us. They're doing this. And so as a black woman, I knew that to be true because I experienced it myself. Right. So that was the seed, I'd say, kept in the back of my mind. Um, Life went on. I eventually ended up that was I was in Cincinnati, then moved to New York City. um, And then I ended up going to grad school there at Columbia. And so I took an entrepreneurship class. And the very first question that the professor asked was, where do you see an unmet need in your community? And then it kind of sparked again. And so, again, this is 2017. I'm in New York City, did this whole business plan. I'm like, okay, this is great, but I can't afford to do this in New York. Like, this is great, but I'm living my regular life. This is fun. And so, again, put in the back burner. Then the pandemic happened. So now we're in 2020. I'm still living in New York. I happen to buy a property here in Memphis. And so this is happening in New York. And I'm telling my husband, I'm like, you know what? Why don't we just go to Memphis and we can kind of fix up this place I bought? Um, In the two weeks that COVID is going to be, you know, over, we'll get it done and we'll come back. And so obviously we know how that kind of panned out, you know. Um, And so life went on in a virtual sense. And so I was actually doing a lot of Zoom calls. I'm a salon girl, but I had to figure it out real quick. So, you know, it was like, all right, I got to go to the beauty supply store that particular day. um, The GPS led me to a beauty supply store on, I think, Danny Thomas and Crump. It was raining outside and it was raining inside the beauty supply store. So it's like all these black women in the store were trying to get our stuff. And like you could see like the little patter like of like, you know, rain kind of coming in, hitting the product. But we all need our stuff. So we're like, all right, we're still going to get it. Mind you, I don't even know where to start, but I'm trying to, you know, hurry up, get in, get out. And then there's like you know, the people who work there all around me, but they're not helping me. They're just like hounding me. It's just, I'm going to steal something. Right. And so it was in that moment feeling like just frustrated and also just almost this sense of like embarrassment too. Like, really? Like I'm in here patronizing you in these conditions, yet you're treating me like a second class citizen. And so it was, that was it. I was like, you know, this ends today. And that was really the start of Pink Noir. So it sounds like from the very beginning, you were already thinking about customer service and how to how black women can go to places and be treated much better. For sure. So let's fast forward to, you know, the store is open. Yep. And you have on your list, uh, uh, you have on your list things that you want to to make, you have things on your list that you said, okay, this is gonna make mm-hmm. my store different from all the other stores, the culture of it, yep. um, how people you know, go with, through the stores. What was on your list at the time, outside of the customer service? Mm-hmm. What are some of the other things that you said would make Pink Noir different? Well, I also, being at Proctor, I knew a lot about making things shoppable, right? And, it's more than customer service. It's about an experience, too. So you want to make things easy to find and you also want to make it an experience. That's why people like want to target places like that. Right. Um, so for me, it was, you know, typically you go in a beauty supply store and it's just like aisles and aisles of different things. And usually it's also by like the actual brand. Um, And so for me, it was like I wanted to do I wanted to kind of place the the store in a shoppable lens in that it's solution oriented. So if you're going and you're looking for braiding hair, here's all the braiding hair. But if you're going and you're looking for oils, all of the oils are together and then they're within brands. Okay, if you're looking for dyes or if you're looking, let's just say to do a wig install 
all of those things that you need are in that same, you know, kind of area. So for me, that was important, but also ensuring that there was a heavy presence of black owned brands and that they were primarily featured, like predominantly featured, if you will. That was huge to me. And not just the big brands, also having smaller brands was key. Um, Because in my mind, I truly believe that we know what we need for our hair. And so if you come into the store, we have a tier. And that's where we start typically when we're trying to tell people about different products we start there and then we branch out but to me those things were extremely important in making my store different so you didn't have the the money to open this type of store in new york Mm -hmm. where'd you find the money that started in (laughs) memphis well okay so i'll tell you (laughs) at that time in my life you know i was still in school right so i'm a grad student and i was just starting my career in fundraising and so i think with you know graduating and then you know i have a real estate business that matured over time and then you know again getting kind of these higher paying jobs in between i was able to then accumulate a little bit more you know to finance something like this now i'll tell you all of these things kind of butted around the same time so i was probably one of the first people who did like airbnb back in the day it was i guess they call it airbnb arbitrage or something like that so i I had a lease and I was like Airbnb in that space out. But then I was living with my boyfriend. <laughs> <laughs> so that was like one of the first ways I made money. And from there, I continued. Uh, we bought properties. And, you know, that's really one of the first businesses that I had outside of Pink Noir. So that is how I got a little bit of cash, <laughs> you know, to fund this. And in Memphis, to be clear, it's a lot cheaper than in New York. I would not. I mean, the space that I have here. I would it would be astronomical to have that kind of space in New York. So what I'm hearing is you have an entrepreneurial spirit and I have always had a hustle That's about true. yourself. That is true. So what is true. was it kind of, you know, you look at the beauty supply industry mm-hmm. and it's rolls and rolls and rolls of products, yep. plus the real estate, mm-hmm. plus the bills, plus the marketing, plus the startup costs. Um, What's sort of a roundabout range Ooh. of what it took to actually get started and how yeah. scary was it? So I definitely um, underestimated the amount of money that was going to be needed. And my mind, for one, I knew I was coming up with a very different model. So I should have accounted for that because most of the times when you see these beauty supply stores, they're like mom and pop type of small operations. The kids working there, families working there. It's not a lot of expenses in that regard. And it's very bare bones. Like you don't see a lot of frills and things. And so I wanted luxury. And, you know, I was going to have these Uh, beauty advisors that were cosmetologists. And so all of those things add up, right? And I did not anticipate that they would add up in the way that they did. Um, So therefore, um, they say if you want like a regular beauty supply store, just the product alone is going to be to start up about $175,000 just product. That's yep. not the lease. That's not the build out. That's just like getting enough product to just start you out. Yep. Um, and then obviously, you know, you, you have a lease, you buy a building. Um, you know, I do think that one of the other things that I know <laughs> <laughs> now that I didn't realize then was I was coming still with a New York frame of mind. So my mind saying, OK, this is how much this costs that's not a lot of money because I'm thinking still about how much things cost in New York, but that was out of market for where I was in Memphis. Yep. So I bumped my head a couple times for sure, um, thinking I had it going on. I knew this. I got a business degree. Like, I, you know, you can't tell. This is easy, so, you know? So one of the trickiest things ever is how business degrees don't necessarily prepare you for entrepreneurship. At all. At all. They prepare you to be middle management at a corporation but not an entrepreneur at a small business. Absolutely. How receptive are people, women, to you actually being a black woman owned business? How much (laughs) much does it matter in the marketplace? 
it's a double edged sword. I'll tell you the positive is that they trust that because I use the products, mm-hmm. because my hair looks like theirs, I'm going to give them a real recommendation. Right mm-hmm. um, now. The other side of that is because I'm a black owned business, I've had people come into the store, just the, the front of the store, see it and like, oh, this is going to be too expensive and walk right back out. So there is definitely this perception that even before they get there, that it's going to be more expensive and maybe I'm not going to have the same level of uh, inventory or whatever it is. So there's those preconceived notions. Is it more expensive? No. Okay. Very competitively. And I actually, because I'm a black woman, I can go in beauty supply stores and do all the recon I want. They don't know who I am. So, (laughs) yeah, I I'm always looking into that. Well, we're going to go to break, but when we come back, we're going to talk about some marketing tactics and some things that you've done to counteract some stereotypes and beliefs that some people may have had about the store and just talk about what's been successful. All right, sounds good. You are listening to Grindset, powered by Kazukian and presented by Epicenter, and we will be back after the break. Grindset. 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 Blues in the basement. Blues in the basement. I was born in 71, so that was kind of the year that all of Al Green's hits starting to pop off. Blues in the basement on the Kazukian Network. Welcome back to Grindset. We are back with our special guest, Chastity Monroe of Pink Noir Beauty and Cosmetics. So we're talking about marketing. We're talking about standing out and being different. You have dedicated your store to having a a luxury experience. What has the feedback been from the customers who come in the store and how do you continue to gather and use that feedback? So people, so it is, I could say it's polarizing, right? Either people 100% love it or they're like, oh, this is too high. You know, like this, I'm going to go to the family dollar next door. All right, it's fine. And that and that's fine. But there are so many people, black women, who have really been wanting an experience in the, in the beauty supply channel. And so I think, you know, we have wine down Wednesdays. We have champagne Saturdays. We have classes. We have, you know, experts that come in and there's just, you know, I definitely think the market has been told that we don't want this, but we absolutely do. And it's nighttime. So I think for those that love me, they continue to support. And that that's really kind of, you know, what we said a brand is, right? It's, mm-hmm. you know, finding your people, finding your following and continuing to, you know, live up to that expectation day after day. Being the marketing branding person that I am, I went and looked at your website and I have to say it is what I wish other beauty um, stores and just local businesses in general did, where it's a website that's just just not about the information and what we sell. But actually, there's helpful tips on there. Can you tell me more about uh, the blog and the types of mm-hmm. things that are on the blog and what has been the response to you having a blog for a beauty <laughs> supply <laughs> cosmetic store? Yes. So I I also think that that goes both ways, too. So we did want it to be one of these things where it was like, you know, very engaging and all of these things. But, you know, when you think about why you're in business, it's about the dollars and cents. Right. And so the engagement does help. And I do think that that, you know, builds that like cult following, if you will. But I also feel that like while I love the blogging, while I love, you know, all of the marketing things that we do and the tips, I do think people can get lost in all of that. Right. And then they forget to buy. Right. <laughs> so it's like you will see like this huge amount of people that are coming to the site. But then and, you know, this is me being very vulnerable. But then when it goes to actually, you know, 
conversion, Mm -hmm. then it gets a little bit lower online. And so we have had to think about, okay, we're doing all this stuff for free, basically. Mm -hmm. Like people are enjoying this stuff, but then they're having a good time and they're going about their business. They're not having a good time and then purchasing. So Mm -hmm. it's definitely made us think about how we can make, maybe there's too much of that. Maybe we need to streamline a bit and make it such that, you know, you see the product, you buy the product, And, you know, then from there, you can kind of engage in some other things. So I think we'll definitely not do away with it. But I do think there's a a way that we can lay it out in a way that makes people do what we want them to do. You said things are a little bit more expensive, but from a margin perspective, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, In the regular beauty supply, that's product, product, product after product, row after row, grouped by I guess brands in addition. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. I'm not sure what the margins are in that. Mm -hmm. But based on the classes that you do, Mm -hmm. the education that you do, do you also demand higher margins in your business? No. From a business perspective, unfortunately not. But um, for us, I feel that this is a change in the actual channel. These are things that should be offered regardless. And so that's just, for me, the cost of doing business. And that's kind of what I've chalked it up as. And I do feel that when you do good business over time, you are rewarded. Um, But on the offset, like at the onset, rather, it's very expensive to do all of these things. But I'm very committed to it because I think we deserve it. In addition to the beauty and cosmetic supplies, are there any other additional uh, mm. things that exist in Pink Noir or that will exist in Pink Noir in the future? Yes. That, that continues to separate you from the industry. So we do have makeup services currently. So if you go in, there's two vanities. So the makeup services are already there. So we'll do lashes as well. Um, now, back in November, we were awarded um, a, a forgivable loan from uh, Edge. And so that was $17,000. And so we actually did renovation. So we renovated our back portion. Um, and that now looks like a spa area. Okay. So there's two spas, uh, spa rooms, if you will. So there's massages, there's going to be facials. So there's going to be a plethora of new services that will be added in addition to the products. And then we have the Pink Noir line, yes. right? So we have our own hair care line where we have, and and I'm not even flubbing this, our edge control is our number one bestseller in the entire store. Shout out to the Pink Noir edge yeah, control. I will be going <laughs> I have to go get my yes. Uh, yes. It does not turn white. The girls love it. We were sold out actually for a while. Um, and we just got it back. So that brought about like supply chain. How do we make sure that that doesn't happen? Right. Yeah. Uh, but I don't think we knew the demand. The demand was so great. We did a pre-sale. People were buying this before it even came in. Wow. So, um, but we have an edge control, shampoo, conditioner, leave-in conditioner, curl cream, foam, uh, braid gel. Um, and there's one other thing we just got, the wax, wax stick. Mm. So, yeah. So I know for a fact that, you know, as a banker and financial professional, uh, the people love grants. Mm. Um, have you received any other grants in addition to edge for you to help your business? Um, no. And you know what? It's interesting because I, (laughs) that is the world that I came from. So I know it very well, but I'll say that I feel oftentimes that it takes me away from the work that I'm doing Mm. currently, because when you're doing those, I mean, and, and I think the grant world knows this, the, philanthropy world where sometimes you make these grants so hard to get because as an entrepreneur of a small business, you're doing everything. And like, that's just one more thing that I have to do that I just don't have the time to do. Edge, it was kind of like, you know what? I feel like I have a really good chance. You know, it was kind Mm -hmm. of like cost benefit analysis. So, Mm -hmm. all right, I think I can do this. I've seen people do it. I've seen, you know, I'm going to do it. But then to just go out there and do that. And then you're not even sure if that's going to really, you know, bring fruit that that's a little bit much for me right now, but it is in my plans. For Shout sure. out to the economic development growth engines, iced yes. loan. So congratulations. Yes. To you. Thank you. So you came to Memphis and you saw a void mm-hmm. 
and you feel it yep. and you're continuing to feel it. But there's also some other things that you've done here in Memphis, such as like partnering with other organizations or beauty institutes. Mm -hmm. Can you talk more about that? Yeah, why that's important to you. And not only did I come here, I'm from here. A lot of people, mm. they're like, are you really from here? Yes. Born and raised, my whole family. I'm for a for real Memphian. Um, I just went away for a few years. Yeah. <laughs> so all that said, yes, that. That being said, it was very important for me to contribute to the entrepreneurial ecosystem. Um, and, you know, I feel that the power of collaboration is extremely important, high, like all of the things. Um, and especially within the beauty community, there's a lot of entrepreneurs. There's a lot of entrepreneurs in Memphis. From what I hear, Memphis actually has the highest number of entrepreneurs on paper, right? But most of them are solopreneurs or this is a side hustle or whatever you want to call it. But still, that is the case. Said all that to say, you know, I do think that in this industry, we have the best talent that I've ever seen. Absolutely. And so for me, it was a no brainer to, you know, reach out to, you know, my girl Tamika from the Institute of Beauty, to Keisha from, you know, A Natural Affair, reaching out to uh, Melanie from the Memphis Skin Academy, because these people, you know, I am a business person, but these people actually know the craft. Like they actually are cosmetologists. They know exactly what they're doing and I value their opinion. So for me, it only made sense. Um, and to also elevate their brands because a lot of them also have their own brands. Um, and we all know that for these brands, what legitimizes them is them being in a retail location. So if I can help them in that, I'm absolutely going to do that. That's that's the point in Pink Noir. Pink Noir is literally not about beauty. It's about empowerment of black women. And so that to me is just a no brainer. It's an aside that's extremely important. You know, that's a big brand difference. And I know just as a black woman myself, you know, looking at beauty supply stores and just wondering how many of them actually give back. I am really hoping that the way you have structured your business, the giving back, the marketing, the standing out, I, it, it really should be standard mm -hmm. for a company like this that's in the community. This is how you do it. Yeah. Quite honestly. Um, Let's see. I think mm -hmm. so. Just to piggy off of mm -hmm. that, um, it is interesting because you see these beauty supply stores and they're staples in our community, but they're not giving back. And so for us, we do that in multiple different ways. One, we invest a lot in our beauty advisors. Right. Mm -hmm. So these are young black women typically who may have just come from cosmetology school, but we're literally bringing in industry leaders to teach them you know, the retail mechanics, you know, we're actually bringing in like one of my good friends is actually the president of my L. And so we're talking, OK, this is really how you use this product. This is also how you sell this product. So as you talk upskilling, that's what we're doing at Pink Noir. Um, you know, we're also going into schools. And for me, I never knew what it I mean, I didn't really know entrepreneurship was a real path for me, right? And especially in the beauty space because I didn't know how to do hair. But nobody told me that didn't really mean anything and that this is our industry to take back. So for me, it is important to go into these schools and to make sure that people know that people like me exist in this space and that you can do whatever it is that you want to do. And there's no reason why you can't do that. So, yeah. Now, I have to ask you this. You're visible in the schools. You are partnering with other institutions in Memphis. You have um, a business model that's really a trailblazing type of model. How? What is the mental health and the self-care <laughs> setup? Okay. <laughs> oh, goodness. Um, so... At one point, I definitely had a therapist. 
And I had to speak to somebody because I also, I like to say I birthed twins. So I have a two-year-old daughter as well. And we're about to celebrate the two years of Pink Noir. So I basically had them at the same time. Um, so th- all that said, you know, I was first time mom of two. <laughs> but, you know, like breastfeeding, postpartum alopecia, you know, gaining weight, um, being an entrepreneur, the ups and downs of just not like, you know, I was, I guess what you would call a high achiever in the corporate world and being here and being unsure and then like bumping my head and failing and you know I'd always get stuff done but it's like there's always like the stuff doesn't end here you know and not ever feeling like I was able to cross off everything definitely did a lot to my mental health so it was definitely finding community and that's a huge thing mentorship networking definitely um, you know I know it's it's not as taboo now, but I do think having a counselor, a therapist, an unbiased third party is very important and critical. Um, journaling, taking time to walk. Like I never, you know, thought that, oh, people go walking and talking about their mental health, whatever. But no, it really does help you to like, you know, like just get your mind together and just meditating is a whole nother thing. Like I'm a big meditator and I do believe in practicing gratitude because a lot of the times you'll find yourself in this space of like people on the outside are like oh girl you living the, you living your best life and mm-hmm. you're in it like oh my god like the whole house is burning down you know um, but finding those moments to smell the roses is so important and critical um, I can't even tell you and, and God and Jesus mm-hmm. and all that I'm sorry if you're not a you know person of that but that's mm-hmm. important for me too this has been an absolute masterclass. And and it has. And so Chastity, uh, to to close the course, yes. can you share some advice that you would have given yourself two years ago before you started? I would absolutely just tell myself that it is a marathon and not a sprint and to prepare accordingly um, and know that, you know, everything is not going to be perfect, but it's going to be worth it. This was absolutely amazing. Thank you for this masterclass on self-care, mental health, entrepreneurship, confidence, standing out, all the things. Grind set. Riffin' on jazz. Just the name of few now. Yeah. The name of few. A few. A (laughs) few. You had too much of that water. (laughs) What's in your water, Howard? Riffin' on jazz. On the Kazookian Network. Kazookian! Welcome back to Grind Set. We have just finished an amazing interview with Chastity Monroe, owner of Pink Noir Beauty and Cosmetics. I think about our interview and I think about things from a creative and branding standpoint. I have one, well, I have two takeaways for you. So let's talk about the first one. In business, you want to be committed like Chastity is to providing an experience like none other. And I'm going to go ahead and tell you, it's okay to go the extra mile because most of your competition is not. (laughs) Chastity has in-person experiences in in the beauty store. She is um, she is partnering with local beauty institutions and schools. Go the extra mile. Those are the things that pay off and you want to start doing those things now because they will pay off in the long run. These are one of those things that if you don't do them now, you're going to wish you did. Also, entrepreneurship is a marathon. It is not a sprint. And when we were talking to Chastity about mental health and just wrapping your mind around getting things done, getting things done in a successful business, there's never a final resting place. There's never a pinnacle of, okay, this is it. You, you'll be better off looking at things in business like phases and launches. And again, just looking at this like this is a journey to be on and not a final destination. And Chastity was certainly uh, dropping key insights and key dimes for the grind set audience. And one of the things that I picked up is that grad school is different from being an entrepreneur. 
even the entrepreneurial class that they teach you. And so here's entrepreneurship 101, according to Grindset. Solve the unmet need in the market. Solve your own problem first. Take action and keep grinding. We'll see you next episode. Grindset. Executive Producer Epicenter. Grindset is directed, produced, and distributed by Kudzukian. Kudzukian.